All right, good afternoon. We're here representing MELO, as you heard. MELO stands for Michigan Education Through Learning Objects. MELO is a cross-disciplinary project. It's now in its fourth year. The various disciplines that have been involved in the study, I'm short, are listed here on the slide. And you've got a nice picture to see some of the faces for the members of our team. In fact, there's a few members of the team that are out there in the audience too. So if you're part of the MELO, would you just raise your hand right now? There's a few at a few tables that can answer questions too. And many of the project participants are involved or connected to some of the larger courses in their discipline, these large gateway courses. The project goal was to improve education of our undergraduates by integrating quality learning objects into our courses. Now, there's a lot of learning resources that are out there, maybe a collection of painting images, for example, but a student will need to know what to do with that collection. How should that resource be used and why? So a learning object is one that will provide a learning goal and an interactive process. Informed pedagogy is going to guide the student along the path with some feedback and assessment. Why did we need this project to meet these goals? Why aren't faculty just making use of the technology and bringing these online resources to their students? Well, from a summary of this survey, we can see that there are some barriers and one of the primary ones is time. It takes too much time, spend too much time working on it, uh, having the skills or the support. And the very first line says, don't know how to implement. That was actually rated as a high barrier by both the students and faculty. So Nancy's going to share a little bit about our solution to overcome some of these barriers. So our unique solution was to say, let us use our students to accomplish the goal of infusing courses with online learning objects and online resources. You'll see in parentheses around graduate because we recognize that it could be an undergraduate student, someone who was savvy with relationship to technology and the pedagogy of learning. But actually we started with graduate students and we proposed to University of Michigan that we would train these graduate students to find learning objects, what they were, what constituted a quality online learning object and how do you infuse it into your course. We also propose that it would be important to have a cross-disciplinary group because this would allow the exchange of ideas, save time, and avoid recreating the wheel among individual disciplines. Now we did not exclude the faculty. We included them in this sense. We proposed that the faculty associated with any course that we hope to impact would be interviewed and we'd collect data about their preferences and the needs of the course. So specifically questions like what are the difficult concepts? Uh, what kind of learning objects, if any, do you prefer? And we'd acquaint them with some, with some of the different types of learning objects. This slide actually represents the data collected after the project started. And as you can see, there's differences among the disciplines. For example, the statistics people wanted simulations, chemistry preferred animations, psychology wanted case studies, and so forth. Um, so we proposed a cross-disciplinary team where you can see the graduate students are represented in that little green box because they're the people who are going to make this go. This is going to really happen because they have the energy, they have the expertise, the technology to, to keep it going and assure that it will happen. Then we have our faculty people. They typically are the coordinators of these large introductory courses. And then we have some other faculty who may also be associated with those courses and in the discipline. And then we also propose that we include some staff so that we could have some technology support because most of us did not consider ourselves very technology savvy. And we also needed some help with uh, managing the grant. So we were um, granted 
money. We were approved in 2008 and our first uh, project ran for two years and it, we were asked actually to, to renew it. We had about three disciplines the first year, we went to about a half a dozen in the second year and now we propose to include more. But notice the change in the title of the project. It doesn't just say learning objects, it says adaptable learning objects. And I'm not going to explain that to you. Brenda's going to explain why we changed that title in, in a moment. Um, I just wish to point it out. We also changed our name from the Ninnies because we had a ninny grant and nobody seemed to like being called a ninny to the, <laughs> to the mellows, the Michigan Education Learning Objects and uh, Mary refers to us as the mellow 3D that's because we were always fooling around with words that began with D we are delightful, we are delicious and so on uh, great group, fun group so in the second project we Primarily, in addition to adding disciplines, we propose to add staff because at this point we found there were roadblocks in terms of just finding quality things out, uh, existing out there. And we wanted to know, or what, is what we're doing having an impact? Uh, and so we needed some assessment support, uh, we needed data analytics support, uh, can we use some of this stuff out there? Is it open educational resource? So you see OER support on there. So to begin with, going back in time, when any new discipline was added to the project, uh, they first, their first task was, after meeting with faculty and finding out what the difficulties were, to go out and find those learning objects. And typically they would create a collection of learning objects that were housed on Merlot. Uh, if you don't know Merlot, Merlot stands for Multimedia Educational Resource for Online Learning and Teaching. And minimally those learning objects were either provided on the syllabus or on a website. And the next charge was to address some specific special need within that course and infuse that learning object into the course. So we're all doing this and collecting learning objects over that first year, but we reach a point where we say, hey, either the, we can't find some, they don't exist, or they're really not ready to get, go into the course. And so here, Brenda will tell you her story about learning objects in her course. So statistics was one of the initial disciplines in this project and in the targeted course was STATS 250, that introductory statistics and data analysis course that a lot of students actually refer to as the course they have to take. The only prereq is high school algebra. We get to meet with them for three hours a week for lecture and then there's a computing lab for an hour and a half where they're exposed to some of the uh, data analysis packages. Enrollment has been growing over the many years. We actually are now over 1,700, 1,750 some students this semester. And we re had a surge of about 300 since last term, which we believe is attributed to advisors saying that you're gonna have that MCAT exam with some statistics on it and promoting that for the students to possibly take. Uh, we have five lecture sections, so a few other instructors teach those with me, and uh, 62 lab sections taught by an army of 34 graduate student instructors that I get to meet with right after this talk. <laughs> uh, we primarily have sophomores taking the course, and they do, though, come with a wide variety of background skills, uh, the knowledge, and their attitude toward the class overall. Now, the stats team discovered a really nice learning resource, an applet online, which had great potential. It would address a fundamental concept on confidence intervals, the idea of what a 95% confidence level really means. It would provide some nice visuals. The user was able to you know, try out some of these different options and buttons and controls, but it wasn't quite ready to be put into our students' hands as is. It was lacking learning objectives. It didn't have any directions for how to use it. And there were a few things that our students would be very confused about. They don't know what this walled method is or some of the notational differences. So rather than typing up all of those words to put them into a document to address these issues and ask my students to read that document before sending them to the link, 
which doesn't usually happen, then we decided, well, what can we do instead to communicate that to them? We created a video wrapper. We used screencast technology to be able to wrap that video to demonstrate the use of this online learning resource and guide them into what we want them to pay attention to and what not to worry about. Uh, it allowed us to tailor this not quite perfect learning object to our students, bringing it to them. We used Jing, which is a very simple software, um, screencast software, and it's free download for both PC and Mac. It does limit you to having videos of five minutes or less, which is probably fine for your students. They'll listen to you for about three or four minutes, and then they want to go on and try that link themselves. So our learn lonely learning object about confidence intervals was sitting out there, and we could have just sent them to that, but it went from this to this. We would take our uh, video and wrap it. Our learning object would be wrapped with this video to give the directives. And then this video wrapper was housed into a site where it would have a roof providing the objectives, what we want them to get out of it, and a basement, a short assessment piece, just to make sure that they did do it. Here's what our house looks like today. So we do have this fully wrapped learning object. It happens to be a pre-lab, something we ask our students to do before they come to lab every week. It's pre-lab three that they just did a, about a week ago in our current class. And it does have the objectives, what we want them to get out of this learning object, the video that they can watch for about three to four minutes. Go to the link and try it out, start playing with it, and a very short assignment, a short assessment piece that should be done very quickly. We want it to be 15, 20, 25 minutes at the most for this pre-lab assignment for them. And it is really something quite easy for them to do. So I'm just going to go out here to show you the actual site where our lessons sit. And lesson four is out there now, since we're doing that for this next week. Lesson three has our objectives, has our video. And I'm going to just play a few seconds of it so you can see and hear. Today we're going to have a pre-lab assignment that will help us to understand the differences between confidence intervals and confidence levels. So we're going to use this applet called Simulating Confidence Intervals. And we have a lot of different buttons on the left and we can set different options. First under method, it's proportions by default. If you're and that's one of our GSIs explaining how to use this applet. Um, it's also got closed caption and we have a YouTube site for Stats250 that our students can go to the video directly, but they're linked from here. We've got a couple of deaf students this semester that are actually using the closed captioning on all of our videos that we have prepared. And Jing is really quite easy to use. How many of you have ever tried Jing software yourself? Quite a few? Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. You got a little sunshine sitting on your desktop, available anytime pick it and say I want to record this part of my screen I want to do a video it gives you three seconds to catch your breath and get ready and then you start recording and explain what you want your students to see what you want them to not worry about I love this pause button right there mm -hmm. so you can look at your notes and you know oh, what was I going to say next and that way you don't have to do the restart button too often when you're trying to make them <coughs> and whenever you're done it renders it very quickly for you so that you can Check it out, see if it sounded okay. Don't worry about making it being polished. It does not have to be camera ready. Recording and explain what you want your students to see, what you do not worry about. And you hear your voice a little bit. You get used to hearing your voice. Save it to your desktop. Put it up on a YouTube channel if you'd like. Um, or just keep the link that you can send to students and see it at screencast.com. So it is very simple to use. We actually have nine pre-labs all together for the semester. And as far as what students think and what graduate students think, my graduate students love them because now their students are coming to lab with questions. They are curious now. They have made them think before coming to lab and they come to lab and there's interaction happening in that lab. The students, well, they like them. They're an assignment. They have to do them to get their point towards their grade. Uh, they do tend to find the ones that have the interactive simulation type of learning objects to be more useful for them. But the bottom line is that they're coming better prepared for that lab discussion. We did a survey and oh, about half of them were saying that they did prepare them for their lab discussions. They agreed or strongly agreed that it was helping them to get ready. And we also have a few pre-labs that are more on the showing them how to do some of these software steps so that they can look at that on their own too, at their own pace. 
we have created these pre-labs that they have to do before coming to each lab, but we also have a second site where we've done some other video wrappers for other learning objects we found in our collections, brought them to them for extra review, which tends to be looked at more before exams. We're tracking the usage since we have it on C tools. And what was neat though is after we shared how we used Jing to wrap our imperfect learning uh, resources to include in our course, well then the other disciplines were adopting and adapting the technology and they were now bringing content to their students in a very innovative way. It's that sharing that was very formative and the development and integration of technology into the courses was because of that sharing. And it wasn't so much that you could find learning objects out there and you just had to maybe make them yours a little bit, put a wrapper around it. Sometimes you didn't find a learning object to address a need that you had in your list for a muddy point that you wanted to have the students get some help on. So if you couldn't find it, what would we do? That was the case in statistics. Uh, one of the skills we want our students to learn and they struggle with is recognizing what statistical procedure that they should use to address a research question or a scenario. I mean, if I give my students some data and I say, perform a chi-squared test of independence, they can probably do that because they've been shown how to do those steps. But that's not the goal in my class. We want them to you know, do what would be in real life. They have a research question. What are the statistical techniques that they can use to apply to it, to an untested scenario? So we've been giving them some practice in paper form. You know, practice matching the scenario to the different background questions. Uh, but we didn't find a learning object that did that very well. In our first year of our Mellow project, we actually had a worksheet or work, workshop for the students, the graduate students, teaching them how to think about designing a learning object. They learned how to find good ones and what the quality criteria would be, but how would they design one? And the outcome of that workshop was just to make a poster and a plan of their design and a statistics grad student designed name that scenario. And this is their actual poster. And over the next year of the project, this learning object actually was created by the stats discipline team and some great IT support. So here's what that learning object looks like, name that scenario. The student would go in and decide which of the different techniques they want practice on. And at some point they may not have seen all of them yet, so they'll pick at least two of the ones that they need to help distinguish. They would then ask for that first scenario, a question would come up, New York and Boston, you know, they don't agree too much. And what about looking at a distribution of preferences on some characteristic? Decide which of the techniques might be appropriate to use and you might get it right or you might get it wrong. And if you did get it wrong, though, it's not just telling you it's wrong and here's the right answer. It will guide you through what you should think about in that background, what response was being measured, how many populations are really trying to compare. So it would give them some guidance. And we built up the database for this by asking graduate students to come up with some scenarios, but we also went to the students and asked them in homework to come up with scenarios to match these different techniques. And they were very creative. So they have been on not just the receiving side, but also contributing sort of as co-teachers to this learning tool. We offered it in the spring term of 2011 to the students. It was an extra credit. If you tried it and answered a survey for us, you got a few points. It was a smaller class to try it out on too. They generally agreed that it was easy to use, helped them to learn, it was a fun way to learn, um, that the questions were not too hard or too easy. We asked them to assess their confidence in the skill before and after using the tool, and they generally <coughs> gained confidence and planned to use it again over the term to practice those other scenarios later. Over the next couple semesters, we've been assessing again, bringing this to our students and trying out some ways of assessing how well it's doing. And in our most recent fall term, about the time when they had learned about five of the scenarios, in lab we gave them a pre-quiz, a name that scenario quiz using the test center, eight points only, and then we gave them a demo of this learning object. And we linked it on their CTOOL site so we could track usage and let them use it if they wished over the next week and 70% of the students opted in and tried it out without any points attached to it. Came back the next week in lab and did a post test. Another set of eight questions that were randomly selected from a bank of new questions that we had. Again, 70% of the students had gone to this learning object over that week before coming back. And these quizzes were not towards their final grade or anything, it was just a practice quiz that they ended up taking in the lab session. In terms of results, well, the average improvement for those that had used the Name That Scenario learning object went up about 1.3 points. For the 30% that didn't make use of it, they did improve some too, but 0.65 points, and that was a significant difference. 
about a week after that, they had their exam too, which was primarily on these five different um, scenarios. And so we still had that tool out there for them to use. And the students who had used it prior to exam two scored higher on average. And then we also pulled out, teased out one of the questions that was specifically that skill, name that scenario, not doing the technique or any of the actual um, data analysis, but just naming the scenario. And they also improved on that particular question if they had used the tool prior to that exam. I think most interesting though is finding out when they're using that tool. And here is the usage where they <coughs> did go to use it in between that pre and post lab <laughs> before exam two. They started using it quite um, greatly. And after seeing a few more scenarios and techniques during class, coming up to that final exam, another peak. Overall, we had 90% of the students end up going to use the tool, and it was just out there as a resource for them not required in any sense. Many of the students returning multiple times. So we had two sort of barriers where we were finding learning objects that weren't quite perfect and learning how to adapt them and bring them into the course, and also actually ending up creating some of these learning objects that we wanted to target certain course needs. I'm gonna turn it over to chemistry with Nancy and she can share some of her stories too. Okay, yeah, I'm here to share my mellow story with regard to Chemistry 125-126, which has had an impact on several components of the course. The course is a large introductory course. I had 1,500 students in the fall in 60 sections. The sections, the lab and discussion sections are taught primarily by GSI. I shouldn't say primarily all by GSIs. We have some undergraduates also teaching. The course is only two credits, but it's four hours a week. And I'm going to focus in my presentation on the pre-lab lecture, just that, one hour a week of the pre-lab lecture. And the purpose of the pre-lab lecture is supposedly to have all students who leave that lecture go out on an equitable footing and, to perf and perform well in laboratory and discussion. Well, the problem that I'm focused on is how to personalize that lecture when it's held in this enormous lecture hall, 450 seats, 1800 chemistry. And this question became more and more focused in my mind over time. It started almost immediately because the, one of the first years I was teaching in 1800 chemistry, sitting right in front of me was almost a totally blind student with a seeing eye dog. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm now coordinating this course. How am I supposed to address the needs of this student? What do I need to do in lecture and lab, etc.? This led me to conduct research over a number of years on how our students process chemistry related to their learning styles and their imagery. And it resulted in, in a paper, it's in the Journal of Chemical Education, and my colleague, Roberta Kleiman, made this cartoon that shows how some of the students are thinking in different modalities about what they're listening to, even though they're all listening to the same thing. Uh, in addition to the difference in learning styles, we found out that faculty uh, image chemistry on a much more abstract level than the introductory students. And the higher your academic level, the more abstract your level of imagery. So indeed, we are dealing with very heterogeneous student bodies, especially in these introductory courses. We also know that um, how successful you are in a course is often related to your academic level and it is certainly related to your background knowledge and skills, and there's lots of research on this correlation. And if you look at this particular printout, this was done just at the time Mello was coming in. This is from the Allison A Academic Reporting Toolkit. Um, if I group all my students together from t year 2001 to 2008, the average grade was about a B. And you just see a straight, pretty straight line across the graph. But if you put the results in terms of the academic level of the student in the course, you'll notice that that yellow line is always typically at the top. Those are your seniors. 
and in the middle you see your sophomores and juniors. The red line I want to point out is pretty consistently at the bottom. That's my freshman. And guess what I'm blessed with? More than 80% freshmen. And so I envy people like Brenda, who has primarily sophomores. <laughs> so such data and observations accumulating over the years kept me thinking about this question. How can I support these students with insufficient background knowledge and skills? And then what about that well-prepared student who's coming into the class you know, maybe I could get that well-prepared student to be interested in chemistry and how can I do this? So how can I personalize that lecture in a better manner? Well, stepping back in time, about that time in 2008, I was also having other problems in the lecture hall. And that is, students in the back of the lecture hall certainly couldn't often see what were very important demonstrations. They couldn't see the curvature of water like the meniscus, the colors were often incorrect. And so I made a goal to start capturing these demonstrations. And so over the summers of 2008 and 2009, that happened. And I was actually uh, a little surprised by some of the benefits that came from doing this because after all in the large lecture hall you're really not hands on. You're still really watching a, like a video down there in front of the lecture hall. But I found that I could do the live demo in sync with the videos. I could now do split screen comparisons like this. Hopefully, hopefully. The original test, we just did it, concentrated HCl into copper sulfate. Now let's do the nitric acid into uh, the copper sulfate. So there's your beaker and here comes nitric acid and Ed's done it. You can see the color does not change. So, I also found that my vision impaired students love to watch these videos and they could blow them up. I could now do time lapsed reactions. And more than that, I was saying, gee, now I can ask these wonderful questions, but again now I'm addressing all 450 students at once. What are the individual students thinking? So I folded these video demonstrations into my uh, lecture slides and at the same time Blue Review was now available in 1800 Chem. It was one of the chosen rooms. So my lectures were being recorded as podcasts. And I was also aware of the wonderful research that Impala and some other groups were doing that showed the really wonderful benefits of podcasting. So. In summer 2010, I decided, hey, why not put all my podcasts up before lecture? Yeah? Okay, these kids are coming from all over different campuses. Hey, there you go, you can have all these learning resources and that. Um, about a half a dozen still said they wanted live lectures. Okay, we'll do the live lectures. And I found they were asking better questions in lectures. I was taking the questions and changing them somewhat. But then I gave a term exam that was identical to the prior summer term. And if you look at the A's, in the prior summer when I didn't follow that kind of routine, I had 25.1% A's. In summer 2010, it went up to 46.9%. And look at the B's. Summer 2010, only 8.5% B's, so it looks like they shifted into A's. And the prior term, it was 24.9%. Now, you should stop and ask me, well, wait a minute. 
you told me that there's a correlation between grades and the composition of the class on the academic level. Oh yes, that is true. And in summer, I have a different composition. I have only a few freshmen. However, I checked the composition of summer 2010 against summer 29, and it's the same. Now, I can't guarantee that this shift is entirely due to the, what I was doing in the class and the implementation process. However, something I agreed was going on. So I repeated it in subsequent summer classes. Now, uh, here is again the LSNA at Academic Reporting Toolkit on the average grade. And here is the average grade of three, around three, before the summer of intervention. It went up to about 3.5. And in the following summers, it repeats. And so this was a long-term impact. And you can point out some other anomalies in the printout, and I can now explain them. <clears throat> Did a survey, what were the major strengths? The main words that were repeated by most of the students is that you can rewind when you miss something. And so they like to go at their own pace and review things. They're clearly saying that in our normal lectures, uh, there's something wrong with the pacing here and that they prefer with the podcasts. The next step in this transformation process had to do directly with uh, Mello and our collection of learning objects. Someone, a GSI in psychology, had charged his students to go out and find learning objects that would improve the course. And they went out and found things he could not find. So we said, let's do this in Chemistry 125. Let's go out and challenge all the students to find learning objects and tell us where we should put them in the course. And lo and behold, more than 100 were submitted. And this was for one, two, or three points out of a 500 course. And some students wrote me that they wanted to know if they could create learning objects. The big message to the Mellows at the time when we were doing this was that students really should be involved in the development of our curricula. They really have a lot to stay. And it changed our thinking, and that's a whole other subject about what happened in Mellow after that in terms of the use of students. So we began in the course 125-126 to have a whole library of learning objects. And this is where a little light started to go off in my head here. And I said, you know, we now have podcasts, videos, learning objects. Maybe we can put them in a pathway for students that we can lead them along this pathway to our goals in a more personalized manner. So I went to our instructional support staff and I said, is there such a tool that I can use that can let me scaffold, put these pieces together in a place? And they said, soft chalk. And soft chalk is really neat because you can embed Word documents in it, you can install hyperlinks, you can drop podcast bits into it to introduce uh, terminology, concepts, whatever you want. You can embed videos from YouTube into it. You can put interactive exercises of all sorts that are provided by soft chalk and open educational resources. So here is just a shot of a page uh, introducing students to the mole. Very basic fundamental. You see there a, a video that introduces them to the mole. That's a bit from a podcast. And then there's interactive exercises after that and optional exercises. We have done some surveys. We're in a draft stage here, and we're now making everything open educational. So our open educational resource people are really looking at the soft chalk materials and then converting everything to open educational um, <clears throat> resources. So what were the main things that they liked or disliked about it? The main th difference you see here between podcasts alone 
and soft chalk is the fact that it's interactive. They really like the fact that it's interactive. And they start referring to the fact that I'm a visual learner, so I liked having the visual availables. And again, they keep referring to the fact that I can go at my own pace, something I cannot do in the lecture setting. Uh, we also did a survey where we uh, gave them some items to look at and I want, I'm brief, I'm going to say if you look at these bars, they're all between 90 and 100 percent. It helped me be, feel more prepared, helped me uh, understand the needed terminology or skills. The one bar that is not up there, well actually there's two, if you look at bar G, that's the one before the right here, I'll have to mouse it, bar G, well what is that? could replace the classroom lecture, divided. And there's H, we're easy to navigate. We're still working on the navigation. So that's my story to date. And Ginger is now going to share her story about organic chemistry. OK, so I'm going to tell you about what we did in, the, um, in Chemistry 216, which is the second term organic chemistry laboratory course. It's very similar to Nancy's course in a lot of ways because it's a high enrollment course. Um, especially in the winter term, there are about 850 students and um, 30 graduate student instructors. Um, we meet for one pre-hour le lecture a week, and they spend the rest of their time um, in lab with graduate student instructors. So I joined the uh, Milo just a couple years ago, and it was after I had taught this course for just the first time. And when I joined the group, uh, one of the first things that we thought about was what was the content in 216 that would most benefit from um, what would be, we'd be doing in the project. Can you choose this? I wasn't on the slide, I'm sorry. I'm not used to this. Okay. So uh, we decided that we would look at spectroscopy. Um, and when we were thinking about it, that was clearly to us the most challenging content for students. And this was evident in the um, course exams because this is where most of the point loss came in um, on those kinds of exams. So um, spectroscopy, in, uh, the students use spectroscopy to determine the structure of small molecules. So this is an example of an NMR spectrum. And basically, it's a series of lines on a number scale. And the students will look at each line and determine something different about the molecule. And they're usually pretty good at that um, because they can follow a basic set of rules and um, work at each piece individually. But then they have to take all that information and combine it together to solve that final structure. And it's that step that really is challenging for most students. And you'll notice with the students um, that are really successful because they've practiced and practiced and practiced that they develop a sort of intuition about how to do that. But they can't explain it to you. So in this particular spectrum, these five lines, if you're curious, these five lines represent acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient in Tylenol. <clears throat> okay, so we had decided to look at spectroscopy, and we knew that Brenda and others in the uh, group had been successful at finding learning objects and, and sometimes wrapping them, and it didn't make sense to us to reinvent the wheel if we didn't have to, so we did an extensive search. Um, but we noticed, um, and, and there were a lot of sites that had spectroscopy, but what we noticed about them is that everything they had was a question and an answer, but there was nothing that helped them with that step in, in solving it. And so we knew that uh, we were going to have to adapt whatever was there or think about it differently. So we developed a strategy um, um, for using technology to do this, and it was a three-fold strategy. So we also decided to create screencast tutorials, or use Jing, um, to do this so that students could see how an expert solved this kind of problem. But we didn't want them just to model after the experts. We wanted them also to develop their own metacognition of the problem-solving process. And so we uh, approached that in two ways. The first way um, was just doing documented problem solution writing, which is a writing to learn technique, where they think about how they solved it and write it down. And then the second thing that we used was an online discussion board where they would have to articulate how they solved the problem, and then they could also see how other peers in the lab had done the same. So I'm not going to show you the, the Jing, but we also use Jing 
um, like uh, Brenda showed you. And um, so we created a whole series of screencast tutorials that um, they could use when they were solving these problems. So the online discussion board is probably the uh, more interesting thing to see um, because it may be new to all of you. Has anyone here heard of VoiceThread or used VoiceThread before? A few, okay. <laughs> I know you have, Gracie. Um, so this is VoiceThread. This is an online discussion board, and you know there's a lot of kinds of online discussion boards that where students can talk, um, journal and talk. But the unique thing about VoiceThread is that it's visual, and you can interact with it visually. So I'm going to show you an example of this. Okay, so this is what VoiceThread looks like. So maybe they'll, they'll all go on and they'll look at the same spectrum and we could tell them each of you need to look at one line on the spectrum and talk about it. Um, so, and uh, here's a, a student's response that we can listen to. All right, how's it going? Uh, so I want to talk about this uh, beautiful spectrum that we have uh, for me. Uh, so as you can see, there are four peaks um, and the one I'd like to focus on that I find personally very interesting is the peak that is right around 11 ppm. Uh, now, due to its location uh, far downfield um, on the spectrum, that means that this uh, representation of H atoms, uh, they are very deshielded. Okay, so I, you know, even without knowing anything about spectroscopy, you can see the advantage of that, right? Because he's having to articulate all of these sophisticated things. He's using the technology, the the um, special terms, and um, really having to think about the solution. Um, I also want to show you how easy it is to use. So everyone who goes onto the site has an identity. So I I have Stewie as my identity, and all you have to do is click the comment button, and you can um, video record yourself, your comment, you can record it by audio, you can type it, and you can also phone it in. I'm not sure about why, <laughs> why that's an option, but we'll just record and we'll say, come on, hello. Okay, so one of the things is while you're drawing or, uh, or while you're talking or recording yourself in video, you can also use this drawing tool. So if I wanted to talk about this peak around four, I can circle it. So that helps anyone who's listening to my comment really see, let me stop that, really see exactly what it is, is I'm it talking while to you're the drawing drawing or, uh, or while you're talking or recording your... Okay, so it plays it back immediately. And so if you don't like what you've said, you can um, change that. So one of the things also that's really great about VoiceThread that was um, the most helpful in a large class is that um, as the instructor, I could go on to and, and look at the sites for each different lab section and sort of sample all of the discussions. And unlike any other uh, method you know, that I've used before, it gave me a really good idea of how the students were viewing a particular problem. So that was especially useful. Okay, phew, it's back up. Okay, so that's VoiceThread. So that was our general plan, and we started, uh, we implemented this on a small scale last year in fall 2011. There is a lower enrollment in 216 in the fall, so that was a natural place to start. We started in three lab sections, and that's about 47 students, um, and that became our treatment group. So all of the students in the course uh, did the same types of spectroscopy problems for their homework, but the treatment group would do, uh, or would have access to the screencast tutorials they would do the documented problem solving and they would be organized into groups for regular discussions on VoiceThread. So one of the ways that we wanted to assess the efficacy of our learning objects um, was this specially designed pre-post term assessment. Um, so essentially we're using uh, the same type of problem that they would see in homework or see on an exam, but we've added a, a second component that asks them to explain their solution. Um, because we felt that in an exam or getting a correct answer doesn't necessarily equal a good understanding of the concepts. So we wanted to dig into their brains a little bit more, and so we added this second component. 
so these are the, this is the results of that assessment. And um, so we looked at both the percentage of correct answers and also at the written explanations. And as you can see, the uh, treatment group uh, had much more success in obtaining a correct answer and they also provided much more thorough explanations um, on the assessment. So I'm going to explain how we coded that explanation because that was kind of interesting to us. Um, we decided not just to look at non-answers versus answers or really look into it that way. We felt that there was kind of a middle ground where some students were providing what we called a limited explanation. And so an example would be, I know this isn't the right answer. So there's a lot of value in there. You know, there's value in that in understanding whether or not, you under, whether or not your answer is correct that is some degree of knowledge. So we thought that that was important. And then to us, uh, a really thorough explanation was something that had sophisticated and specific um, observations and analysis included in that explanation. And of course, we saw a lot more of that as we had hoped. Okay, so um, one additional thing that we did, of course, we did surveys and those were largely possible or uh, positive and we asked the students to comment. And so they, they agreed that it was generally useful and helped them in preparing for exams and that forcing um, themselves to have to speak through the problem aloud was a good thing and, and that they liked looking at the responses that other students had posted. So that seemed to work so well that we decided to go ahead and jump into the deep end of the pool and implement this in winter term and that's when we have the highest enrollment in the course. And so we implemented in a, about a third of the course, that's 19 of the lab sections and about 269 students. <clears throat> so uh, this was a lot more complex as you can imagine and we really didn't get the kind of traction on these that we had experienced in the fall. Um, but we did see similar results in the spectroscopy assessment or, uh, I'm sorry, similar results in this survey, but the spectroscopy assessment, we didn't see a statistical difference between the um, participating and non-participating students. So um, at that time, we decided that we needed to look at the C-Tools usage data um, in order to look at it from a different angle. So this is one of the, the things that we looked at. So we looked at exam performance um, relative to um, how often or how often the students had used the learning objects. So both the VoiceThread and the screencasts were linked out through C tools, so we could monitor their usage over the term. And uh, so this is the second exam, which has more spectroscopy content in it, but it is not entirely spectroscopy. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, but there was a positive correlation here, uh, showing us that. Um, increased learning object usage had a positive impact on their performance on the exam. Um, so we also looked individually at spectroscopy questions. And so on the left hand side, you'll see an easy spectroscopy question and on the right hand side, a difficult spe spectroscopy question. Um, so you can see that there's a more of a correlation for the difficult spectroscopy question. And so um, that suggests to us that these learning objects help them to be more successful on the more difficult problems. So that's the last of, um, for my part, and I'm about to share with you kind of the last important data for the talk today. And I'm really excited about this. I think this is, if you're going to take anything away from the talk, this is what you should take away with you. So this is a diagram of sort of the Milo Group social network, and um, as we call it. So at the very heart of the group, we have Nancy and Brenda, who brought everyone together. And um, they came in with their expertise from the University of Michigan Merlot com community, and they brought everyone together, including staff who are shown in blue, some of whom are here. And uh, in the purple are all of the faculty that participated. And then around the periphery, you see all of the many graduate students. And the lines that you do see um, indicate how someone came into the group. So if you see me, I'm way over on the left. I brought in Renata and Grace Winchell, who's a, an LA fellow, and I'm sitting in the audience. And I knew Nancy, so that's how I came into the group and, and all kinds of connections. But almost more important than the connections that you see he, here are the connections that you don't see. And um, so 
one of the things that we were thinking about is if you could draw lines between all of the shared ideas, um, then this would just be completely covered. And you know, one of the most important things about the group is, is this collaboration. And um, we came up with a term, or they came up with a term for it called cross-pollination. Um, and you know, that's really undervalued and it's a hard thing to measure, right? Um, but some of my best ideas came from people who are doing things in a very different disciplines like history. Who would have thought that an organic chemist could learn something like that from a, you know, someone in history? So that was pretty incredible. Um, and then the other piece of data that you can't see are the thousands of dots that would appear around the outside. And that would represent all of the students that were impacted by our work in the group. So a large impact. <laughs> uh, and that concludes our talk. And thank you. I, I think I share with uh, Brenda and Nancy and uh, uh, really being glad that we were here today. And we're happy to answer any questions. You don't recall having international students in my summer classes. I knew all the students pretty well. Um, the main thing difference, as I said, is that I had more upperclassmen. And I think I had in a class of 50, maybe three freshmen. So that impacts on the results. But the term exam where I gave the results had been used consistently each summer and was secure. So one of the neat things about a lot of these interactions is that they do generate enormous amounts of data. Like listening even to the one example you give of this voice thread thing, boy, it's fascinating to see how they think about and can explain and can't explain what's going on in them. Um, anybody doing any work with those? I mean, I, you could take one of those problems and have 500 kids explain it in their own words and have a decent yeah, I have archived all of the transcripts from that, and so I have in mind to look at that maybe with a, a text analysis tool or a really ambitious graduate student. <laughs> yeah, so it's in the back of my mind, but boy, that's, it does seem like a lot of work, and I'm not sure when it will happen. But I'm holding on to it just in case. <laughs> Jared. Um, I want to stay with that voice tool. I, I wasn't sure if you had looked at this or, or, or if it was... But there, it, said, it looked to me like there were students who were contributing as teachers. They were doing this problem. They were, you know, and, and, it, and then obviously that, I'm pretty sure you were also measuring who was reviewing this. And if, I was curious if you had looked at those two groups separately and tried to quantify the effect for students that are contributing the content. Right, and so uh, the analytics on the VoiceThread site itself doesn't have that capability yet. They're just building that in. And I don't think they had anything at all at the time that I was using it. Um, and I, I'm not sure where they're going with it. But the way that we looked at it, just linking through C-Tools, we could only see if they visited it. But you know, another way to get at that was to go back and look at the transcripts um, and try to correlate that to the timing or something like that. I'm not sure. That, that seems pretty convoluted. But uh, you could also look at the, I mean, that was making me think of looking at the different comments and, um, you know, there are very few responding comments. They would go in and make their comment for the first time, but it wasn't very often that they would come back and say, hey, I noticed you said this. Did you think about that? And so, um, you know, we would like to encourage them to respond because this asynchronous, but we do want them to come back and interact more as well. Can, can you say a little bit more about this voice thread in terms of, uh, I presume it's a cloud service and it, it costs money. Uh, that's question one. And then question two, I mean, have you thought about maybe bringing back some of the best of from what you have and then asking your next generation students to comment on, you know, to kind of enhance or to get students used to commenting, maybe kind of throw them some content that they can comment on. Yeah. 
So question one, it's free um, and I use a free version. Um, you can go on, if you, if you want to kind of navigate with a larger group, you can get a pro account and it makes it a little easier and I think it's like $90. And I was able to set up um, a whole number of discussions that way. The university also, through the CRLT, I think has um, looked into site licensing and there is some limited licensing which may be expanded I think but they would be the people to ask about that but it's certainly here but even using it and it's easier to use it even in this large class I used it from the basically free version um, you just have to be very creative in how you organize it <laughs> um, so that's what we did um, you know I haven't used VoiceThread again in 2.16 and it's because I knew that before I used it again I had to spend a lot more time thinking about um, how we set it up because as I said we didn't get the traction you know in the fall there was all this water cooler chatter about it um, amongst the students did you see so-and-so's post and you could hear it in the lab and you knew that it was it was um, catching on we just didn't see that in the winter and there was more of this general feeling I think of this is more work this is already a two credit class why do we have to do this voice threat thing also so not as many students were into it um, but I really love the idea of using those uh, comments again later, or maybe even when I, not, not necessarily when I use VoiceThread in there, that would be great.